Okay, um, so let us begin this evening. Uh, Tony is somebody who, if it were not for him, the level of interest uh, in the history of the Hudson Valley would be nowhere near what it is now. Through his weekly Dateline newspaper column in the Poughkeepsie Journal, uh, through his books, through his tours that he gives of sites in the Hudson Valley. Tomorrow, I believe, he's taking a tour of the retired Kingston Teachers Association uh, to a variety of places, some of which he's going to be talking about tonight. And through lectures like this, uh, he probably does more, not probably, he does more to promote the Hudson Valley than just about any other initiative that I'm aware of for tourism in any of the counties in New York State. So we are very fortunate to have him here this evening. This is actually, Tony, your, it's at least your eighth yeah, presentation yeah. to uh, the Historical Society, and we're blessed to be able to have him. His range of areas of interest and that he's written about uh, range from uh, setting the record straight, which I think was in two volumes, and uh, corrected the misperceptions about rock stars like uh, uh, Connie Francis and Peggy Lee, and he also, as a someone retired from service as administrator in the post office, uh, he wrote about FDR in the post office and also spoke here on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the Rhinebeck post office. And the topic that he's going to address tonight is a continuation of a topic that he's addressed uh, the hidden treasures of the Hudson Valley on two other occasions when we heard about Hidden Treasures Volume 1, Volume 2, and now it's Volume 3. So, Tony, we are blessed to be able to have you, and uh, what you have to say is going to be a lot more important than what I have to say. <laughs> so, Thank welcome. You. <laughs> Thank you, and I'll just correct one thing that Mike said. If it wasn't for the, and I dedicated Volume 2 of the book, to all our municipal historians and all the volunteers that work at the historical societies because they are really the ones that promote the history. And if I do something in any small part, it's really not uh, Nancy's here. Uh, she's helped me with a million columns and different things as Mike and David has as well. So uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, and we got a nice turnout again and I'm well aware that I get a great turnout in Rhinebeck because you have good food. <laughs> so, you know, let's put things in perspective. Is anyone here not familiar with the Hidden Treasures book series? Okay, so I won't go into the whole uh, process of what uh, they are, you know, that there's no Vanderbilt Mansion in these books, there's no FDR home, there's sites that are kind of uh, you might pass every day and not know that the Continental Army once had a headquarters in that building. So um, this volume, like volume one and volume two, has another 55 sites. And the sites in this book range from Westchester and Rockland County up through our area, what I consider the Mid-Hudson. And on the west side of the river, it goes as high as Saugerties. And on our side of the river, it goes as high as Hudson. So the only county I think I missed from Volume 2 in Volume 3 is Greene County, but the rest it kind of covers the whole uh, Hudson Valley region. Um, and like I did in the previous uh, two volumes, I end each chapter after I share the history, I end it with a physical address or exact driving directions because I try to promote day trips. Because if these sites, which many of them are run by historical societies, um, they don't get the visitation, I'm fearful that, you know, we're going to lose them. Uh, I'm happy to say that out of 165 sites in all three volumes, I've only lost one so far, and that's the Nelson House in Poughkeepsie, which was taken down a few years ago. 
because we need crabgrass and a bench on Market Street. <laughs> Enough of my politicizing. <laughs> um, so we're going to start, actually, I'm going to start down in Westchester. We'll swing over to Rockland, come up and uh, swing over the Kingston Bridge and end up in this area towards the end. But I'm going to start with a site that is pictured on the front cover of the book, kind of looks like a castle. Uh, some of you may be aware of it. It is in Katona, New York, town of Bedford, and it is called Caramore. Anyone familiar with Caramore? People that are familiar with Caramore, for the most part, are familiar because during the summer months, and believe it or not, I just got an email from Caramore yesterday, they have music festivals, and I got the whole schedule yesterday by email. They have a wonderful jazz festival, they have uh, symphony orchestras, uh, opera singers, it's really, really a wonderful place to visit. But what a lot of people don't realize is this gem right here. You know, the people will come to the concerts and everything and then go home. But for a fee, you can go in and tour this house, which is magnificent, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it now. In 1938, this was a 100-acre property owned by a woman named Carolyn Hoyt. And the, the, the estate was named after her, Caramore for Carolyn Hoyt. Well, at this, she was looking to sell it in 1938. She was getting on in years. Her primary residence was in Manhattan. Well, coincidentally, at the same time, an interna very successful international banker and attorney named Walter Rosen and his wife Lucy, who also lived in Manhattan, were looking for a weekend getaway and a summer place. Turns out, just by coincidence, that one of Walter Rosen's law partners in his uh, practice was Carolyn Hoyt's son. <laughs> so he said, you know, you're looking for a place, my mom is selling a place, why don't you come up and take a look? Now at the time, Carolyn Hoyt had a small arts and crafts home on the property. It was just a very, very rural country place. Well, the Rosens came up. They immediately loved the grounds, 100 acres and this and that. They bought the house. They wrote a check on the spot and mm -hmm. bought the house from her on the spot. When they moved up, the only thing Walter and Lucy Rosen weren't crazy about was the arts and crafts house. So that was the first thing they did. They took the house down and they put up this pretty spectacular Mediterranean, Mediterranean revival villa with a red tile roof a central courtyard, and an arch gateway entrance. Now, this tree is blocking the entrance a little, but you can see the top of the archway. And this is the main entrance to the house. You go into the archway, and the door is on the left. If you continue forward, you walk into what is called the Spanish courtyard. And they even have concerts in there during the summer, different sorts of concerts. But if you go into the courtyard, there are French doors that allow you to enter every room on the first level. And then upstairs is just bedrooms. Um, they were both very big art enthusiasts. And so the house is, uh, is home to a lot of famous artists' works. They, they put a lot of world-class artists' paintings in this house. And they're still in there today. Uh, they also display uh, many sculptures of artists on the grounds. They were very big into music and art. Now, the largest space in the residence is called the Music Room, and it is 40 feet wide by 80 foot long with a 30 foot high ceiling. That was basically the Rosen's living room. And I often laugh when I think of that because it's bigger than my house. <laughs> But they had little concerts in there, they entertained in that room, and, uh, and that was their, their, you know, the, the room features French and Swiss stained glass windows and basically served as a, their entertainment place. Throughout the house, there are also rooms that are designed, furnished, and have paintings that reflect a single country in Europe. There is a room that is dedicated to Italy, another one to France, one to Spain, and another one to England. In other words, all the furnishings relate to that country, the paintings relate, the rugs, and everything else. 
The grounds include a sunken garden, which Carolyn Hoyt originally had the sunken garden put in. The Rosens enlarged it quite a bit. And today, during the summer, they actually have acoustic concerts. It's very, a very intimate space, and they just put chairs in between all the hedges and things. Uh, it's pretty neat. There's a tennis pavilion and a number of gazebos on the property. Now, when the Rosens received word in 1944 that their son had died while fighting in World War II overseas, they decided at that time that upon their deaths, they were going to bequeath the estate and they wanted it to become a center for music and arts in memory of their son. Well, Walter Rosen died in 1951, and Lucy, his wife, died in 1968. In 1971, the Caramore Center for Music and Arts opened, and that's why you have the music festival every summer there. However, the house is open just about all year, and for a fee, they give you a nice tour of the house, you can walk the grounds all day if you want. It's really pretty. I, when I went out to do these pictures for the book, I, I spent a lot of time on the grounds because there was so much to photograph. It's a very beautiful property. You can see by the lack of a lot of trees. I do most of my pictures in March and early April because I don't want the leaves covering most of the buildings that I photograph. But even then, the gardens had uh, nice displays in them and everything else. They have several gardens on the property. They have a butterfly garden. They have a pinoni garden, uh, all different types. So you could spend a lot of time on the grounds itself. They also stage, if, if you were so inclined to go out there with a few friends, afternoon teas where they'll have a musician playing and you have your tea and crumpets or whatever you're going to have. And, at the end of the chapter, in addition to the address, like I do with all the sites that are applicable, I have their website and phone number at the end. So go on their website, check it out, and you may see something that you, you want to take part in, or just go out and tour the house. Now the second house that's in Westchester that we're going to discuss is down in Mamaroneck, very close to the Long Island Sound, the north shore of the Long Island Sound. And the main reason I put this chapter in the book, let's face it, we, you know, let's be real, there is a lot of hatred in the world today. I mean, politicians are fighting and, and uh, world leaders are fighting. There seems to be more unrest now than I can ever remember in my youth, which was a couple of centuries ago, <laughs> it feels. Uh, the site that I put in the book is just a perfect example of how great life could be if one neighbor treated another neighbor with kindness. And that chapter is titled, The Skinny House. <laughs> now there are a number of narrow or skinny houses all over the world for a variety of reasons. Some are known as spite houses. Anybody have any idea about a spite house? The oldest spite house in this country is in Marblehead, Massachusetts, and I'll tell you the story about that. Two brothers inherited a nice piece of property to overlook the Salem Bay. Beautiful sailboats going by. They could not agree what to build on the property, and they were in some fierce fighting. Well, one brother had to leave for about six months. While the brother was gone, his sibling built a beautiful house with a big front porch overlooking the bay. Just gorgeous. But when his brother came back, he was furious that he went ahead and built this house without consulting with him. So he built a 10-foot wide spite house right in front of the front porch, <laughs> all but blocking the view. And that, my friends, is spite. <laughs> this, on the other hand, by contrast, this skinny house was built in 1932 in Mamaroneck, Westchester County, as a result of one neighbor's kindness to another. Nathan Seeley was a very accomplished, self-educated African-American carpenter. And with his brother, he started a really lucrative business. What they were doing, the two brothers, is they were buying parcels of land all through Mamaroneck, and they would build houses he was making a profit, but he was making the houses very affordable and, and was very high quality. He was a very, very good carpenter. 
and they were catering to uh, black folks that were coming up north around 1916, 1915 in the Great Migration. They were moving up north for better opportunities and a better life. And so he was catering to those people. Well, uh, he became so successful that he eventually built his family a beautiful seven-room house that is just beside this blue marker here. It's sitting out of the picture frame. He built his family a great house. His wife had a beautiful garden in the backyard. And everything was going great. This is on Grand Avenue in Mamaroneck. One day, an Italian immigrant who had just arrived in the country knocked on his door. He had heard it, that he owned the business and he had these lots. And he said to him, you know, I know that you're a builder and everything. He says, but I love the lot right next to your house here. And I'm wondering, I'm a builder too. Is there any way you would just sell me the lot uh, and, and I could build my own house? Well, Nathan Seely looked at him and he said, you know, you seem like a really nice guy. I'd like to have you as my next door neighbor. And he did that. He sold him the lot. And this actually is the house that the Italian immigrant built right next door to him. Well, everything was going fine. But unfortunately, when the stock market crashed in the 1920s, that great migration all but stopped. People could, people could barely put food on their table. So people weren't moving up. He was falling into default on the many lots that he owned around Mamaroneck. He lost all of them. He had to file for bankruptcy, lost his business. And then he eventually, because he was dead broke, he lost his family home. Well, as they're getting ready to move out, the Italian immigrant comes next door, knocks on his door again, and he said, look, you've been a great neighbor, and I remember you, know, you sold me this without wanting to build a house. What I'd like to do is deed a 12 and a half foot by 100 foot piece of my parcel so that possibly you could build your family another house on it and you won't be homeless. Well, this is that 12 and a half foot by 100 foot stretch of property. <laughs> and Nathan Seeley built this three story, 10 foot wide by 37 foot long house for his family. And they had children, they raised them there. Now, when you look at this house, it's pretty amazing to me. Well, I'm not handy in the least. He built this house completely on scraps that he picked up throughout the town. He had no money to even buy lumber. So this entire, everything you're looking at, that's what a crafted uh, carpenter he was. He just took scraps. He and his brother actually found a defunct railroad line and they cut a piece of straight track 37 feet long and that serves the center beam down in the basement. <laughs> what you can't see in this picture is that there is a steel beam coming down this side and that side because it's very close to the Long Island Sound and all the other houses are one story. And he didn't want it to blow over in bad <laughs> weather. So the house is stabilized. Now, Nathan Seeley died in 1962. And uh, the last daughter that ended up living in the house uh, in 1986, she was 86 years old. And she wanted to go into assisted living, and she did so. Well, the granddaughter of the Italian immigrant now owns this house. She went to the nursing home, and she said, look, you know, I don't care that it was my father's property before. I would like to purchase the land back from you with the house. And she did so. And from 1986 until about two years ago, this was a rental property. I guess you could call it a very unique mm -hmm. apartment dwelling. <laughs> People were just renting it out. Two years ago, when the last tenant left, she told me, that she wanted to update at least the kitchen because everything in here was from 1932. So she went in, she went to redo the kitchen and had an unbelievable termite problem. Oh. Could not afford to fix it. There was no way she could afford to fix it. So she did the smart thing. You, you two would love this. She donated it to the Mamaroneck Historical <laughs> Society. <laughs> How about that for a solution? They went out and got a federal grant because it's a historic house. They are now just completing the renovations in the style of Nathan Seeley. They did not modernize it. 
and they're going to be giving free tours of the house. And I will be there on opening day because the <laughs> granddaughter told me she'll call me a week ahead of time. <laughs> Uh, so it's just a very unique story, and I thought it was so heartwarming, I wanted it in the book. That's what really got to me. What's the opposite of a spite house, though, isn't it? It's the exact opposite of the spite house. Yeah, it's just, if everybody acted like these two people acted, the world would be a much better place. Now, Mike said I take these uh, bus tours around with different groups, and we are. I'm taking the retired teachers of Kingston, and they were very interested in art. I have two of my artist friends here. Uh, they're very interested in art, and so the whole tour I'm taking the group from Kingston on uh, includes art type of places. <coughs> and the next one is the first stop we're going to make, and it's in Hastings on Hudson. And it is the Jasper Cropsey House and Art Studio. Uh, during the 19th century, Jasper Cropsey was one of the most renowned painters associated with the Hudson River School of Art. As we know, Thomas Cole was the founder of that movement, and his house is up in Catskill, and it's in volume two of my book. Right across the river from Catskill, you have Frederick Church's house, Olana, which to me is the most spectacular house you could visit. And he was probably the leading artist of that time. Uh, of that movement. Well, Jasper Crosby, although his name is not as well known as Frederick Church, he was really right up there in, in popularity and fame during that period. Uh, Crosby began his career as an architectural apprentice in New York City uh, around the 1840s. By 1843, just for his own amusement, he started doing watercolors, bless you, and, art, uh, and oil paintings of landscapes. Well, he came to the attention of the National Academy of Design in Manhattan, and his first art exhibition took place there in 1844. It was so successful, and he sold so many pieces of art that that same year he gave up architecture <laughs> and went exclusively into oil and, and uh, watercolor uh, painting of landscapes. Um, his work quickly gained him fame and fortune, and he was primarily known for his lavish use of colors and his breathtaking landscape scenes. He married a woman named Maria Cooley in 1847, and the couple traveled through Europe for the next two years. Heck of a honeymoon. Uh, but uh, they visited uh, Italy, France, Switzerland, and England to study the different art styles there, and he painted a bit while he was over there. Upon returning home, he opened an art studio and a gallery in Manhattan, and that's where he sold his artwork from. But then he also leaned back on his architectural background, and he designed himself a beautiful 29-room mansion in Warwick, New York, with an art studio attached to the back of it. Everything was going fine, but unfortunately, by the 1880s, the style of the Hudson River School of Art was kind of falling out of fashion. You know, art goes through these periods where you have the uh, Norman Rockwell period, you have the, the Andy Warhol, you have the Peter Max, and on and on. <clears throat> well, his style of painting was falling s way off the charts, and he ended up having to sell, a, he called it Aladdin, his mansion. He ended up selling the mansion, uh, selling all his furniture, and auctioning off the paintings, over a hundred paintings that he had already completed. They moved across the river to Hastings on Hudson to have a, a simpler life, you know, because the, he wasn't generating the money he was earlier. They rented an apartment for one year before purchasing this house on Washington Avenue. This house was built in 1835 and uh, he named it Everest. The only alteration he made to this house, which is out of the frame of this picture, is he built a beautiful, beautiful big art studio that's worth a visit just to see the art studio. It's got a cupola up top, the northern light has plenty of, of, of glass come in, and uh, it's just a spectacular room. And he continued to work there. Like I said, he named the place Everest, 
They lived out, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cropsey lived out their lives here. He died in 1900 at 77 years old. And uh, his wife Maria died six years later. Now one of their daughters was tragically killed in a car accident with a husband out in California. So they ended up taking in their daughter, which was the granddaughter to them, and they raised her here. Her name was Isabel. Now, uh, Isabel, after they both passed away, she married a man that became a, a five or six term mayor of Hastings. So there was a lot of entertaining done in this house. It was thought to be high society. Actually, from that front door, when you look uh, west from the front door, you're looking right down at the Hudson River. It's just magnificent, really, really beautiful. And so they went on and on, and then uh, they, they both passed away uh, in the mid-70s. In 1977, Isabel's daughter, her, name, her married name now is Barbara Newington. She married Mr. Newington, who was a very, very wealthy man. She is still alive at 93 years old. She lives in Westport, Connecticut, which should tell you right there that she, <laughs> we're not having benefits for her anytime soon. <laughs> and interestingly, her and her husband started purchasing her great-grandfather's paintings back in the 60s. She was buying his paintings for 50 and $100 that today would command five and $10,000. And they had over 200 of his paintings stored out in Westport. You know, some on the walls, some in storage, being protected. Well, in 1977, she created the Newington Cropsey Foundation for two reasons. To preserve the home and the paintings and to keep her great-grandfather's name in the public view. Uh, in 1994, on the back side of this property, they built a beautiful, beautiful uh, art gallery. It's called the Gallery of Art. And uh, that is where 200 of Cropsey's oil paintings are on display. The house has many of his watercolors on display, except in the art studio. There's oils in there. Very accomplished painter. Uh, and the amazing thing about this site is, you know, I always talk about the economical benefits of going to the sites in my book because if they're run by a historical site, they're either free by donation or maybe $2 to get in. This is absolutely free. The, uh, when I go down, this will be the fourth time I'm taking a bus group to this house. I don't even take a donation. They, you know, because usually if it's a free admission, I give a donate. No, the foundation covers everything. So it's, it's just, and you don't need 50 people on a bus trip. If you're three or four people and you want to go down next Wednesday, you call the number that's at the end of the chapter and you say, look, I have a few friends, we'd like to come down, 10.30 in the morning, is that good? If, it's, if it works for them, the director will meet you at the gate, give you a 45-minute tour through the house, and then you go down to the art gallery and spend as much time as you want looking at all the paintings down there. I can tell you honestly, it rivals any museum I've seen in Manhattan. It's, it's just a really, really nice place to go. So now we're going to leave Westchester, and we're going to head across the Tappan Zee Bridge. Get my little point in there. The Tappan Zee Bridge. And we're going to go to the village of Chester. Now, the reason I say that is the Tappan Zee Indians, there was a reason why it was called the Tappan Zee Bridge. And I'm supposed to be a historian, so I get, you know. So now we're in the village of Chester. In 1834, the New York State Legislature was persuaded uh, to authorize the construction of the New York and Erie Railroad. That railroad began in Piermont, New York, down in the Nyack area. It went 400 miles north up to Dunkirk on Lake Erie, so it was a very long line. As construction moved forward without incident, when they got to the village of Chester, the workers uh, had to contend with what locals called black dirt. We all know what black dirt is? Basically meadows that were huge swamps. Workers were forced to drive hundreds of piles 50 feet down into the ground, into the wetland, to reach solid ground that was capable of holding the tracks and the weight of the trains. 
In 1841, the first station to be built on the line was in Chester, and Chester and Goshen became the first stations on the route to get full-time agents. The first passenger train arrived in Chester later that year, and the most prominent passenger on that train was the Secretary of State, who was named Daniel Webster. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about Daniel Webster is he refused to sit in a passenger car on that first train, the inaugural ride. Instead, he sat in a rocking chair on a flatbed car <laughs> in the middle of the train. Now, he explained it that he, he did that to better enjoy the beautiful surroundings of the ride. But his political opponent said, no, he just did that to be better noticed. <laughs> One way or another, whatever the story is, they say that that influenced a lot of the later politicians, including our neighbor Franklin Roosevelt, who often campaigned off the back car of a train. It just became a great way to campaign that way. So Daniel Webster created something positive. The dairy industry was the driving factor to the railroad success, and in 1842, the first shipment of 240 quarts of milk left Chester destined for New York City. By 1900, about 7,000 quarts of milk a year were shipped down from Orange County uh, to New York City, and that became a major economy uh, boost for the county. In 1915, this station was built. They needed a larger station. And the 1841 station stood right next to it, but was exclusively used as a freight house. No passengers went in there anymore. But by the 1950s, 60s, 70s, railroads were starting to take a serious hit. Why? Because People like you and I were buying automobiles. The New York State Thruway was being built. Parkways were being built. And people did not have to rely on railroads to get to destinations anymore. So a lot of railroad lines across the nation started shutting down. Well, the, uh, but let me see, the uh, Chester station shut down completely. It shut down earlier for passengers, shut down completely in the 1980s, early 1980s for freight, and the line just shut down completely. The Chester Historical Society was founded in 1964, and 20 years later they acquired the station. The members meticulously restored the structure, and in 1999 they opened the building up to the public as a museum. So if you're a train buff and you're into that kind of thing, there's a lot of memorabilia, a lot of uh, artifacts from the New York and Erie line on display there. Uh, and they have a lot of things uh, to the village of Chester as well on display. They also have lectures in there on occasion, and I have their contact information at the end of that chapter. So, and that's free of charge too. They don't charge anything to get in there. So now coming up a little further north, we're going to go into Campbell Hall. Is anyone familiar with the Thomas Bull Memorial Park? It's over in the Montgomery area. It's Orange County's second largest park, and it's, it's, they have a botanical garden there. Uh, they have a lot of concerts in the summer. It's a, it's a very nice park. Well, anyway, the next site we're going to go to is the home of Thomas uh, Bull. This was built in 1769. He named it Hill Hold, and it was the home of prosperous Orange County farmer Thomas Bull. He was the fourth of 12 children born to William and Sarah Bull, whose house, whose stone house is on 100 acres, very near to this one. Now, there is a chapter in the book, it's called the Bull Stone House for the parents. This one is called the Hill Hold Farmstead. But they are pretty close, and you could visit both of them in the same day. In 1724, William Bull, the father, was very loyal to the crown, and he petitioned King George I for additional property. Well, King George I gave him 500 acres, which is a pretty nice gift. Upon his death in 1755, the land was divided between Thomas and his brother, William. They each got 250 acres each. And if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, 
You said there were 12 siblings. Well, the other 10 were girls. And in, unfortunately, in those days, they did not make out deeds to the girls, so the two boys got the whole parcel. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> in between planting crops, Thomas Bull planned to build his stately home to reflect his family's wealth, and, and the paneling on the first floor of the house was imported from England. The interior was also fitted with mahogany balls for the newels on the central staircase that goes upstairs, and they also had mahogany balusters in the house. I've taken two bus trips here already, and uh, really, really nice, impressive. The house has wide plank floors, several fireplaces, and it was built of native limestone. Now, following the lead of his parents, Thomas Bull and his wife had and raised 12 children in this house. I have two children. I don't know how they got along with 12 children in this house. This is interesting. Because Thomas, like his father, always remained loyal to the crown, he was imprisoned several times during the American Revolution because he constantly refused to sign the Articles of Association pledging loyalty to this country. The interesting part of this story is that as passionate a loyalist Thomas Bull was, his wife was just as passionate a patriot. So there must have been some very interesting conversations in that house. And as a side note, I wonder how they even had 12 children, but that's, that's another book. During the 19th century, the house became known as the Bull Jackson House because a descendant, Civil War Captain William A. Jackson, was born here. During that period, a number of outbuildings, you can see one out there, a Dutch barn, were put on the property. Everything is still in place on the grounds. Now, after the last of the Bull descendants moved out in 1960s, Orange County knew the importance of this property, and so the county purchased it. They opened it up as the Hill Hole Museum. They charged a big $3, which is the best deal in town. You should probably count on about two hours because, because it's a county site, they moved a wood frame one room schoolhouse onto the grounds that was someplace else in Orange County. And that's where you start your tours. They give you a whole, you know, you sit in the desks and they give you a whole, uh, uh, narrative about how one teacher taught eight grades in the one room. Very interesting. And then you go through the house and then you can spend time on the grounds uh, here. Now, like most of the sites in all three of my books, the season is May through October because those are, you know, they don't want to be open in the winter time. This, however, during the entire month of December, every weekend they open for candlelight tours for the holidays, and they have hot apple cider and things of that nature. So this, uh, I've enjoyed it every time I've gone there, and I'm sure you will too if you do go there. Okay, we're going to come up to the town of Marlboro. We're getting a little close now. We're kind of across the river and south a little. I spoke in, in Marlboro last night, so these people enjoyed this chapter. Uh, this is in uh, the hamlet of Milton, and I titled this chapter, The Fighting Quakers of Milton. Now, if you know anything about the passion that Quakers or the Religious Society of Friends has towards pacifism, you almost will never see fighting and Quakers in the same sentence. I titled the chapter, The Fighting Quakers, because that's what accurately describes the action taken by two brothers in Milton and a cousin that they had up in Kingston when all three joined the military during the Civil War to battle the southern states. In Milton, Edward and John Ketchum were very devout Quakers and very, very highly educated. And they, but they had extremely strong feelings about the battle to abolish slavery. They were encouraged to join the war by their cousin, who was already in the military. His name was Captain Nehemiah Halleck Mann. And he was serving with the 120th Regiment out of Kingston and wrote to them frequently. The siblings originally wanted one of them to stay behind with the mother, who was a recent widow and lived on a farm. 
So Edward, being the oldest brother, was the first to join in July 1862 into the newly formed Ulster County Regiment. Edward Ketchum eventually ended up at the Battle of Gettysburg, and he was in a battle that was so brutal that his commanding officer had just advised him to remain un under cover as much as possible. His reply, quote, a dead man is better than a living coward. When he said the word coward, a bullet struck him in the forehead and killed him instantly. Now, five months prior to that happening, his younger brother John was getting antsy on the farm. So he went ahead and he joined Company M of the 4th New York Cavalry out of Manhattan. Like his brother, because of his education, he was made a second lieutenant. And he engaged in numerous battles down south until he was deemed unfit or exhausted to continue service. So the army sent him to Seminary Hospital in Washington, D.C. to recover. This is the amazing part of the story. Maria Ketchum, their mother, gets into a horse and buggy in Milton and by herself in the middle of the war travels to Washington, D.C. to personally care for her surviving son. When he recovered, she came back to Milton, stayed on the farm. Uh, when he recovered, he was sent from Seminary Hospital to Virginia, where unfortunately he and another 23 Union troops were captured by the Confederates. And they were imprisoned in a prison in Richmond, Virginia, that has had documentaries done on it. Uh, if you want to go on a computer and go on YouTube, Libby Prison, L-I-B-B-Y. Uh, there are documentaries. It was uh, just a horrible place. It was disease-ridden. It was filthy. And it became very known for that during the Civil War. Well, unfortunately, John Ketchum succumbed to both his failing health and the disease at the prison. And he died. When the war ended, Maria Ketchum took a carriage and a horse once again, went down south, recovered both remains of both her sons, brought them back to Milton, and buried them in the Hicksite Cemetery. In Milton, Milton was a hotbed for Quakers back at the Underground Railroad days, it was a major stopping point. And there was an Orthodox cemetery that's still there, and this is the Hicksite Cemetery. Well, they were Hicksites, so she buried them side by side in this cemetery. It is right along 9W, and the crossroad, do you know where Ship's Lantern Inn is? Yeah. It's the crossroad just before you come to Ship's Lantern Inn. It's called Willow Tree Road. That's the intersection where the cemetery is. Don't try to look at it from 9W. I tried three times, and I kept slinging into the other lane. I don't want anybody to, you can't see it from 9W. But if you go around a little shed that a cabinet maker uses, it's perfectly legal. Go around the shed, go up on the knoll, you'll see the cemetery. And right where they are buried, I, where I took this picture from, right behind me is the grave of their cousin, who also perished in the war. And his gravestone is distinct, and it has a stone captain's hat on the top of it. So a uh, little history from Milton, New York. Now the last one we're going to see in Ulster County before we come on this side of the river is in Kingston, New York. And in Kingston, New York, in volume one, I wrote a whole chapter on the stockade district and explained how the settlers went in there and put a half mile stockade fence around to protect them against the Native Americans because the Esopus Indians were not at all happy with the settlers settling on what they considered their land. Well, this is in the Stockade District, and I go into great detail on this thing. This is the Stonehouse intersection. The four corners at the intersection of Crown and John Streets in Kingston have the distinction of being the only intersection in the United States to feature four 18th century stone structures on each of its corners. They were all constructed prior to the American Revolution, and they each sustained serious damage when the British came in and burned, basically burned down the Stockade District in 1777. Now, why did they pick the Stockade District? Because that was our first capital. 
and General uh, General Clinton became our first governor, and that's where the state, that's where the Senate House is, where our state government was formed. So the British came in in seven, uh, 1777, damaged just about every building in there, but didn't completely damage them. Uh, this building here, you can only see two of the houses on the intersection. <coughs> but to be honest with you, there was construction going in on this side, and I didn't want it in the picture. But uh, this house here belonged to a man named uh, Franz Rogan. It's a one and a half story house on the northeast corner of the intersection. Now, following the attack, when the British left, this part of his house was gone. Uh, the house goes way back, but this part was gone. And what they did was they took that empty lot and they put gallows up, and they were hanging British spies on that ground. Well, when everyone was repairing their houses, Franz Rogan said, "Wait, well, you know, you have to take these out of here. I want this is my property. I want to fix my house." They made him pay seven pounds ten shillings to reclaim it, even though it was his property to begin with. Well, he got back at them. He sent his sons out on the property before they came, and once he paid the money, and they took all the gallows down, and to this day, the ceiling beams in this house are all form a gallow, <laughs> parts of the gallow. So he got his money back. <laughs> now, in the basement of this house, as you find in a number of houses in the Stockade District, there's a quarter of a mile tunnel that leads out and goes into the woods. That was originally put in a lot of the houses when they were fearful of Native Americans attacking them. So you get your family down in the tunnel and you could come out a quarter of a mile out and escape any harm. Um, the Matthew Pearson house, unfortunately, is out of this picture. It's right across the street. That's on the southeast corner, and it was repaired immediately after the British left. Uh, it was used as a public house, a tavern, during those, that era. Are those tunnels still in existence? Yes. Really? Well, yeah, some of them are filled in for security reasons. You don't want, I mean, I'm sure they blocked them off, but the tunnels themselves are still under there. You're to walk through or you just have to crawl through them? I never went in one. Oh. I never <laughs> went in one, I'll be honest with you. But I, you know what, some of them were probably pretty deep because I know that during Prohibition, some of them were used for uh, bootleg. That's a lot of digging. There's a lot of rocks. You know? Well... Uh, read the chapter in volume two about Dutch Schultz's underground distillery in Pine Plains. They were pretty amazing, you know, and they wanted to get things done. Anyway, this was a tavern. The family lived in the rear, and in 1820, Dr. John Goodwin bought it, and he added a wing onto the side of the house and opened the pharmacy. So it was kind of like one-stop shopping. You went to the doctor, he gave you a prescription, and then he riced next door, and he filled your prescription. Um, across from the Pearson House is a stone building built in 1774 to serve as the Kingston Academy. That was a very prestigious higher learning institute. It was the first academy to open in New York and counts among its graduates New York State Governor DeWitt Clinton. It later was used by a cabinet maker, and then it was used by the Kingston Daily Leader Weekly newspaper. Now, this house here, this two-story house, is the oldest of all old, the all four, and that is the Matthew Jansen House at 43 Cowan Street. It was built in 1700, so this was the earliest one on that corner. After being rebuilt, it went through a series of owners. It was home to a delegate to the New York State Consti uh, Constitutional Convention. A dentist had it for a, a period of 20 years. He had his practice on the first floor and lived above with his family. And then finally, a reporter for the Daily Freeman newspaper bought the house, which tells me I need to quit the Poughkeepsie Journal because I'm not making that kind of money. <laughs> so something's going wrong there, unless she got a big inheritance. Okay, we're now going to cross over the bridge, come back over onto this side of the river. Uh, some of you may recognize this next chapter in the book. Right up the road. And even though you recognize, and I don't know if everyone in the room, there's a good chance you've all been there, but I think the history is fascinating, and that's why I put it in. 
sitting just north of the Route 9, Route 9G intersection on the west side of Route 9 is the Quitman House, a structure built in 1798 as a parsonage for the pastor of St. Peter the Apostle Church. It sits on land that was purchased from Gilbert Livingston in 1729. Reverend Quitman was hired as the first pastor of the church after serving as the pastor of a Lutheran parish in the West Indies for 12 years. The parsonage was made up of 10 rooms and Quitman kept his large bed in a space that was formal, uh, subsequently used as a dining room. He had a, um, he had a large iron ring installed over the bed and had a rope looped in it. He weighed in excess of 330 pounds, and he used that rope every morning to pull himself up and help him to get out of bed. Throughout his tenure at St. Peter's, Quitman baptized more than 1,500 children and performed 708 marriages. As the congregation continued to grow, he oversaw a complete renovation of the church. Now, Quitman and his wife raised seven children in this house, three of which went on to achieve distinguished careers in their own right. His son, William, became a local physician right here in Rhinebeck, while his brother, Henry, became the town supervisor of Rhinebeck in the 1830s. John Anthony Quitman, whose name is prominently displayed on this historic marker right out in front of the house along Route 9, um, was a lawyer and a soldier. He became a judge, a member of the Mississippi State Legislature, a congressman from Mississippi, and finally he was elected governor of the state. Now, failing health forced Reverend Quitman to retire in 1828 after serving as pastor for 30 years. The church went through a pretty serious decline after he left, not just because of that, but other churches started opening in the area, and then the Livingstons were buying up a lot of properties that belonged to some of the congregants and taking their houses down, and they moved away. So it just kept going down and down. The church held weekly services through 1939, but at that point it became a quarterly meeting. The parsonage was occupied by subsequent pastors until 1929 when it became a rental property. During the 1970s, the house faced demolition. It was very deteriorated. But a group of concerned citizens got permission to restore it. And in 1976, the Quitman Resource Center for, for Preservation was founded just to meet that objective. Today, the structure is the Museum of Rhinebeck and is open to the public on Saturdays from May to late September. Um, I also took a bus trip here, and uh, they came away very, very impressed. They really enjoyed it. In fact, a lot of them, after the tour, took off through the, the graveyard, and they were going over to the church, taking pictures and everything. They were very, very impressed. So if you're local and you haven't been there, now's your chance. We're into May. The next spot we're going to do is in Millbrook, and some of you that are gardening enthusiasts might have visited this place, in his free gardens. This is 185 acres of streams, waterfalls, terraces, retaining walls, rocks, and plants based on the principles of Chinese landscape design, which is very important because a lot of the gardens are either Italian or French design. Originally, this was the country estate of Walter and Marion Beck, and it became a public garden in 1960 in accordance with their wills. Its name was derived from the 1888 poem, The Lake Isle of Industry, by Irish poet William Yeats. Now, Marion Beck was an avid gardener, and she had amassed property that totaled 924 acres before she even married her husband, Walter, in 1922. And that's the kind of woman I'm looking for. If you have 900 acres, <laughs> see me after, we'll talk. <laughs> Walter Beck was a teacher who was influenced by Asian art, and during the 1930s, he became infatuated with Chinese and Japanese garden uh, <clears throat> excuse me, designs. Uh, 
1938, the Becks met Lester Collins, who would go on to become a renowned landscape architect. In fact, he designed the gardens at Georgetown University, uh, the Naval Academy in Annapolis, the Baltimore Zoo, and ver a lot of other prominent gardens around the country. Over a period of decades, Collins transformed the Becks estate into a world-class garden. When Walter and Marion Beck died in the 1950s, their wills called for the property to be open to the public, and they left a foundation to help maintain it. Collins incorporated busy stonework, detail, and plants with lots of colors on different shapes of the terrace. It's kind of like going into, for those of you that have been there, it's kind of like going into separate gardens. It's like going into different rooms and different designs. Really very, very impressive. There's an island in the middle of the lake there, and it's a feeling of complete natural experience, except for a 60-foot high geyser of water that was installed. In the 1970s, all but 185 85 acres of the Beck property was sold to the Rockefeller University for ecological studies, and that is what sustains, that money sustains the garden today. They do charge a fee to go in, but it's well worth it. You could spend the whole day there. Uh, there are a lot of benches around the lake and everything else. Innisfree Garden attracts approximately 10,000 guests a year, and it's open again. May through October. So it is right off of Route 44, for those of you that don't know where, where it is, when you're going Route 44 to get to Millbrook, you're going towards Millbrook, uh, Tyrell Road is on your right hand side. There's a sign, unfortunately, it's about this big, and it says <laughs> Innisfree with a little arrow. But uh, you go down that road about, well, almost a mile and you'll come into the grounds. It's got a very small dirt parking lot. But I'm going to speak about one more site, and then I'll have some questions and answers if you have any. And this site is uh, typically what I like to tell people. Some of these buildings, this you go past so many different times. Well, this is on Main Street in the city of Poughkeepsie. So imagine how many cars go by this every day and don't give it a second glance. This is a one and a half story, 18th century Georgian style red brick building on Main Street that was built in 1767 as the residence for the minister of the Poughkeepsie and Fishkill churches of England. Now today those churches are both still in existence. The one in Poughkeepsie is called Christ Church and it is on Montgomery and Academy Street. And the one in Fishkill is still called Trinity Church. And that is uh, on the east side of Route 9, just below Route 52 or Main Street in the village. Glebe is a Saxon word meaning an area of land which proceeds support the parish and provided a home to its minister. In 1766, the Poughkeepsie Church and the Fishkill Church decided to share services of one minister, and they hired the Reverend John Beardsley. He had a choice of living in Poughkeepsie or Fishkill. When he chose Poughkeepsie, the joint congregation bought him a 23-acre farm, and they built this house as his, uh, as his residence. Uh, the home had three bedrooms, a parlor, a study room, and a keeping room. Anybody want to take a stab on what a keeping room is? Nancy? I don't want to put you on the spot. A keeping room is the room right next to the kitchen. The kitchen fire would never go out. So on a cold winter day, the family would all sleep in the keeping room to keep warm. And that's where they got that from. Everything went well until the American Revolution stopped, because don't forget, the Reverend Beardsley was a Tory. He was a loyalist to the crown. Well, at that point, services in both churches were terminated, they were suspended, and he was confined to the house unless he was going to christen a baby or anoint someone that was ready to die. Other than that, he had to stay in the house. On December 5th, 1777, the Poughkeepsie Council of Safety ordered Beardsley and his family out and to relocate to New York City, which was a hotbed for the British. Um, 
from 1780 to 1785, this was the quartermaster officers of the Continental Army. In 1792, the two congregations decided to sell the house to a private individual, and he lived there till 1809. When he moved out, the property passed through a number of hands. The last two people that owned it both ran a florist shop out of the house. And it was a big greenhouse in the back, which is no longer standing. When the second owner of the florist shop made it known that she was going to take the building down and put a larger greenhouse and operate out of that, the Dutchess County Historical Society and the Common Council of Poughkeepsie decided that this was not going to happen. They bought it, and the city still owns this property. and now operates under the auspices of the Mid-Hudson Heritage Center, which a good friend of mine, Roy Budnick, founded and runs. And right now, what they do is they give tours in here. They have Friday night lectures and different things. So I have their website and phone number, and you can go on their website or give them a call and see what event. There's always something going on. Uh, in the property. So now I've been going on for about an hour, so I'd like to open it up for questions if you have any.